Robin Soderling, the man who produced the biggest shock in tennis history, and also the man who had one of the most tragic ends to a career you could ever think of. Today, we're taking a look at one of the saddest stories in tennis history. Robin Soderling was born in Sweden in 1984 and started playing tennis at the age of 5. With some very characteristic but powerful ground strokes, it was easy to see that Soderling had a lot of talent. He had quite a lot of success as a junior, winning the Orange Bowl and reaching a junior career high of world number 2. A very good sign as the great majority of top players very usually have a great junior career as well. But his first years in the tour weren't that easy for Soderling. 2003 would be the year that Soderling would establish himself as an ATP player, finishing the year as world number 62. In 2004, at the age of 20, Soderling won his first ATP title at Lyon. He finished the year as world number 42, having good results in fast hard courts, but the Swede didn't win a single match in the clay court season. In 2005, Soderling would have his first serious injury that ended up requiring surgery in his knee, but his recovery was quick and six weeks later he was on the court again. But this was the first season of his career where no progress in the rankings was made, as he ended up the year as world number 43. In 2006, we saw a little step forward as he ended up the year as world number 25. 2007 would be the year that Soderling would become famous, but not because of his results. He became famous when he faced Rafael Nadal at Wimbledon and did this. The court, Rafa held up the ball and then there, the mimic you talked about, Mary. From that point on, it became clear that Nadal and Soderling weren't precisely best friends. But anyways, Soderling ended 2007 as world number 28. And at this point, yes, he was a dangerous player, a hard hitter, not the type of guy that you want to see in your draw but not that many people at this point would trust him to have top 10 potential. His results at Grand Slams were not the greatest, his best result at a Grand Slam after his fourth season in the tour was round 3, and his ranking hadn't progressed as some of the other guys with similar age. But 2008 would be a big year for Soderling, not because of a big result or a huge move in the rankings, but because he decided to break up with his coach, Peter Carlson, and he started working with former world number 2, Magnus Norman. And this was surely the step forward that Soderling needed in his career. Just one month after starting with Norman, Soderling won his first title in three years, again at Lyon, but this time beating two top 10 players on their way to victory, Andy Roddick and Jules Simon. And Soderling finished the year for the first time inside the top 20, with a ranking of number 18. And now is when the fun starts. 2009. We're in the clay season, where like I mentioned before, Soderling had struggled to get good results. We're in Rome and Soderling reaches the third round. There, Rafael Nadal was waiting for him, the man who he had quite an interesting beef with and who by the way is almost invincible on a clay court. At this point in time, since 2005, Nadal loses less than one time per year on this surface and Soderling was destroyed on this match. 6-1 and 6-love, a quite cruel scoreboard for a man that at this point of his career really wanted to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best players in the world. And Norman, his coach at this time, has mentioned how this match really affected Soderling, as he was very upset after the match, telling Norman that the difference of level didn't feel that big. He couldn't comprehend how the final scoreboard was 6-1, 6-love, Luckily for Soderling, if that was the case, he would have a chance to prove it, because some weeks later he would face Rafael Nadal at the French Open, after just having his greatest Grand Slam victory defeating David Ferrer in the previous round, in what Soderling considered at this time to be the best match he had ever played. But now came the bigger match, not the bigger, the biggest of matches, facing Rafael Nadal at Roland Garros. Nadal hasn't lost a single match in his whole career, in fact, no one's even taking him to a 5th set. He is 31-0 and searching for his 5th Roland Garros in a row. And remember, he's the man that's just left him one game some weeks prior. But this match started completely different, with Soderling continuing the best form of his career, hitting the ball extremely hard, completely surprising Nadal in the first set, that quickly went to Soderling by 6 games to 2. 
The Spaniard was able to win the second set by 7 games to 6, but the feeling of the match is that he depended on his opponent, who had control of the majority of the points. So he basically was depending on a guy that was on absolute fire, ripping both forehand and backhand, and the topspin shots by Nadal, that are normally a nightmare for the rest of the tour, were suiting Sorling perfectly for his game style. The third set went to Sorling by 6 games to 4, and the whole tennis world was being shook. The first man that took two sets from Nadal at the French Open. But could Soderling finish the deal against a man who's never lost a match on that court? The closest thing to being invincible. Would he be so cold-blooded, especially in the finishing stages? Well, as you may know, he absolutely was. Finishing the match with an almost perfect fourth set tiebreak and shocking the tennis world by doing what nobody had done before and even 15 years later, only one man after him has done again. This was not only the biggest shock in tennis, but one of the biggest shocks in sports history. Nobody could see Nadal losing at Roland Garros, but especially against someone who he had just demolished weeks before, and as we've been seeing, had not had such a great career till this point. He wasn't a superstar of the game. In fact, he was more famous because of being Nadal's enemy than anything else. But Sorling wouldn't stop here. He would prove that this surprise wasn't a coincidence, and he continued playing the best tennis of his life, defeating Davidenko in the quarterfinals and Fernando Gonzalez in the semifinals. He had a round three as the best result of his career, and now Robin Serling was in a Grand Slam final, a final where he would face Roger Federer, who finally would face another player that's not named Rafael Nadal, and Federer would take his chance, defeating Serling in straight sets in a match where the Swede wouldn't play as well as his previous matches. Probably a combination of nerves, and as he described later, playing such a different player like Federer, who didn't give Soderling the rhythm that all the previous players he had faced gave him. But although he lost in the final, this tournament would give Soderling brutal confidence. He truly believed he belonged in the top 10. His mindset had now changed. In his mind, he was the favorite against any player in the tour, besides the big three and Murray. And his results later in the year proved that this mindset was the right one. Fourth round in Wimbledon and quarterfinals at the US Open, where in both occasions he lost to Roger Federer, who was surely becoming his nemesis at this point. It was now very rare to see Soling being defeated by a guy outside the top 10. He classified himself for the NITO ATP finals, and this was again one of the great highlights of his career, because although he lost in the semi-finals, he defeated both Nadal and Djokovic in the group stage. Again, massive victories that would only boost his confidence even higher. 2010 would be another massive season, as except for the Australian Open, where he lost in the first round, Soderling had another incredible run at Roland Garros, producing another great shock. This time not as big, because he was now very well known for his talent, but in the quarterfinals he defeated Federer, stopping a historic streak by Federer of 23 straight Grand Slam semifinals. And again he would classify for the final, where again he would face Rafael Nadal. Would Lightning strike twice? In this case, it didn't. And Nadal won that French Open without dropping a single set getting his revenge over the Swede. They would face again at Wimbledon, and Nadal would beat him in four sets. A Nadal that would win his second Wimbledon title. So pretty much in every Grand Slam event, he was losing to who would eventually lift the trophy. At the US Open, he lost again against Roger Federer. But later in the year, Soderling would win the biggest title of his career, as he won his first Masters 1000 at Paris beating Monfils in the final, and rising to a career-high world number 4. And at the end of the season, a quite surprising event happened. Soderling and Norman would break up. The coach who he had so much success with. The man that had helped him make such a huge step forward in his career. But this event didn't seem to affect Soderling very much. Because he started 2011 winning 18 of his first 19 matches. Winning 3 out of the 4 events he played. And with consistent good results, he maintained himself as world number 5 throughout the season. At his home event in Bastard, he completely destroyed his competition. He defeated world number 8 Thomas Burdick by 6-1, 6 love, and defeated world number 6 Ferrer by 6-2 and 6-2 in the final, lifting the trophy in home soil. Little would we know that these were the last images of Soderling as a professional player. 
So what actually happened? Soderling would withdraw from Montreal and Cincinnati due to a wrist injury, but still had plans to play at the US Open. But these plans were broken as Soderling contracted mononucleosis, a virus that as you may know, makes you feel very weak and it would be completely impossible for Soderling to compete at the event. But the thing about this virus is that it affects differently to every individual. It normally takes quite some time to overcome it, some people do in 2 or 3 weeks, but for Soderling things became really bad. As the Swede says that he spent 6 months in bed with pain all around his body and a horrible sense of fatigue. Every little movement or thing he had to do became extremely tiring and what we fans didn't know is that Soderling throughout his career had a hard time dealing with anxiety, especially when he became a top player. As he explains that after his massive run at the French Open, the expectations he put on himself were extremely high. He now couldn't stand losing matches against lower ranked players. He put so much pressure on himself that at times he was even crying at the locker room before matches. And this anxiety that I'm describing could be a big factor to why Soderling had such a tough time overcoming the virus. As with anxiety, your immune system is much weaker. And unfortunately, not only Soderling would have a very tough time to overcome the virus, but he would never be able to fully recover after. As in the next years, when Soderling tried to come back to the courts, every time he would want to rise to certain intensity at practice, he would feel absolutely exhausted. It became impossible to gain the form to be able to play at professional level. And this would only make his mental health and anxiety problems even worse. And Soderling describes this as a very dark period in his life where he had panic attacks and in many cases was thinking about ending his life. So the idea of returning to professional tennis had to very sadly come to an end. And to make his mental health better, Soderling would now need to focus on other stuff that's not playing the sport that he loves. So in 2014, he created his own brand, which sells tennis items, of which the Soderling tennis balls have became his bestseller. In December of 2015, after making several tries to make his return, Soderling announced his retirement from tennis. A big step to be able to completely focus on his personal life, enjoy his family, his projects, and the little things in life. In the last years, he's been both the captain of the Swedish tennis team, at the Davis Cup, and for some time he coached the Swede Elias Emer, so he's maintained himself pretty involved with tennis one way or another. So this was the sad story of Robin Soderling, a man that had to leave tennis when he was playing the best tennis of his career and had a ranking of world number 5. It's certainly one of those players who could have had a chance to win a Grand Slam. He had already made it to two finals and he had proved that there was no player in the tour who he could not beat and he was one of those guys that if he caught fire it was extremely difficult to stop him. What do you guys think? Would Soderling have won a Grand Slam if he didn't catch this virus? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit the like button. And to enjoy more original tennis content of this style, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. All of this said, I hope I can see you all in my next video.